wow, I'm happy to be here and hope that you are too. Thank you, thank you. Last week was on kindness, kindness. And we're, that means we're on lesson number eight. We're on week number nine, technically, but lesson number eight follows up with goodness. Sometimes you might think, well, what's the difference? Honestly, when you're just going through a cursory reading of the, of the fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians 5, you might think, these sound the same. I think it's just all talking about the same thing. Just, just be a good person. Well, especially kindness. Isn't kindness and goodness the same thing? From the perspectives that we're taking last week, we emphasized, as well as this provided for you in the teacher's notes uh, up front, in case you missed that or want a copy of my notes, kindness in practical application in this earth is doing what is right, behaving godly towards people who you either at the current time don't like or who do not deserve anything but the opposite. That's not easy. And I hate to summarize so simply, but that's a good way to emphasize our class theme Divine fruit is hard to swallow. Kindness is sometimes not doing what you want to do. But goodness, what's the difference? Isn't kindness and goodness the same thing? If you have one, you have the other. I hope that you remember clearly your um, uh, personal points from last week's class. Today, you'll see some differences with goodness. You cannot have the fruit of the Spirit if you do not have this. This is a building block of your soul and the very character of your spirit. So we're going to talk about goodness in a little different way. I'll be honest with you, it was a great challenge for me this time. A lot of the sources that I thought I would use throughout this series, I haven't used as much as I thought. Because when I type my own notes and do my own references, that's about the study time. But today, I used a lot of resources. The first half of this class may sound like a... <laughs> like reading a commentary or a dictionary, it might bore you to tears in advance. Yeah, cliff notes, uh, and I'll provide them next week in case you want that. But hold on to your attention, please, because we're going to make the difference. And thank you, Michael. This man is so good. Uh, must, be, must be in the name, right? <laughs> I love it. No, good guy. Um, I'm hoping that you enjoy di uh, discerning, the, the discussion to discern what makes goodness good and the difference between all the other things like for example previously kindness we want to understand this as a fruit of the spirit and we want to understand how to have it what makes it difficult what makes it hard to swallow because struggling to live godly in a sin saturated world you might remember i also told you that i consider titling this class or describing it struggling to live godly with a sin-saturated soul. We struggle every day with sin, and I'm, uh, I'm just in a constant state of sin, cleansed constantly by the blood of Christ. I can't go five minutes without sinning. I don't know about you. I don't know what planet you're living in, if you can go longer than that, but I can't go five minutes without sinning. So think hard and long about that. We need Christ every second of every day. So how can I, if sin's nature is what I've embraced, be good? Well, there is none righteous, no, not one. But is righteousness goodness? Oh, let's have some fun now. You ready? <laughs> Excuse me. I can't. I remember one microphone we had. There was a little mute button right here. And when we upgraded, I, I missed the change. So sometimes I would push this and clear my throat. You wouldn't joke. Uh, uh, not, uh, you wouldn't jump and, and jerk. But hard to avoid that. <clears throat> All right. Here we go. Class number eight. Week number nine, the lesson on divine goodness. Enjoy some of these factual points and follow your outline. Make notes if you want. I will stress the key emphasis for our understanding today. And again, half of this class at least will be study. Study, 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 and then we'll apply it towards the end. The word for goodness is, um, let's see, I'm looking at it. I heard it in my mind last night. Agathosune, agathosune, it takes the place or the meaning by its context. Okay, so what is good? What makes something good? Well, it's by the context being described. In what way is anything good? The context defines the sense. Basically, it means, quote, being good finds its meaning in the deed or quality which exhibits it. 
Don't you just love when a definition uses the word it tries to define to define it? That doesn't tell me what I need to know, but it gives me an idea that, okay, I need to think harder on this, do some research. We might say that that is a good animal, that is a good pet, that is a good watch, that is a good cup of water, that is a good clicker, that is a good light fixture, that is a good window. What makes anything good? That is a good person. Well, in this case, a good watch, we would assume, does what it's designed to do. A good watch keeps time accurately, serves your purposes, fits nice, maybe aesthetically, pleases you. It's a good watch. Uh, a good course, a good college course, or a good class series addresses the material that it promises by title, and it shares the material in a helpful way. A good deed meets someone's needs. Um, I had, by delay, a gift that she had gotten me. She knew one thing that I was wanting to aid my work in the evenings, um, and was, I was getting tired of having the computer, my little laptop, on my, on my lap, on my knees. Well, she bought me a very cleverly designed um, uh, arm to go under the chair and above me so it's not on me, and I can tilt the computer and do all that stuff and then just easily turn and push it away, it rotates and everything. Love that little gift, and it's going to help so much. I love it. Well, that's a good computer desk because it serves its purpose. It does what it's designed to do. Statement by Jesus reflects the varied use of goodness. If you have trouble understanding goodness, don't worry because it's used in a variety of ways. Matthew 7, 17 says, Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. Okay, a good tree, good fruit. So that tree does what it's supposed to do. The fruit does what it's supposed to do. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Luke 8, 8 he says, some seed fell on good ground. What's good ground? Good ground is apparently there to serve the purposes for what you're using it for. Luke 8, he says, some seed fell on good ground, so good fruit trees are the ones which serve their purposes of yielding edible fruit. Good fruit means it meets the needs for the body's nourishment. Good soil is useful for growing crops. You get the idea. Whatever is described as good accomplishes the purposes for its intended use. The word goodness. Galatians 5.22 presents a problem, however, at first. The context, the immediate context, is just surrounded by a bunch of other beneficial, positive, good spiritual traits. But it gives little meaning to that one word goodness outside of that context. Unless you look at the whole chapter and the pericope of the whole book, then it makes sense. <clears throat> the larger context of where this word good is found is in contrast to the ungodly behaviors of the world lost in sin and to those who are then motivated to live by the influence of the Spirit. So, righteousness, godly living is good. This is no accident. Fundamentally, then, goodness may simply mean serviceable, useful for a specific purpose, right in heart and behavior. Right in heart and behavior. So, goodness, agathosune, uprightness of heart, beneficence, Christians that need to be filled with it, are found in it. You can do kind acts and not be good. Kindness is godly behavior towards all people in all situations. But in your heart, are you good? That motivates that. How do you feel in your heart? This is something we grow into. This is going to be a heavy paragraph, so I will read it very slowly. We're studying the fruit of the Spirit goodness. We think we know what it means, but it's not as easy as we think. So if this were strictly a, theolo a theology or philosophy class, we would probably spend our time focusing on the natural question, what is good? And then we would even question what is good. We 
discuss if moral goodness could be separate from the concept of God. You know, is it good because God says it's good? Or does God say it's good because it is? is? Is goodness above God or beneath God? No, goodness comes from the flow of God's nature. So we believe in the description of the Bible for God, the, the source and the essence of all that is good. We think about God and his spirit, his just spirit. He would have been just to not even create us. He is so good on what was even needed to create the whole universe and us in it. That's a good key thought for later when we think about what we do and why we do what we do to be like God. <laughs> we believe the goodness is of God flows from the nature of God in the form of his will, the Bible, so that we can live by it. And we are empowered by his spirit to live by it as we actively yield in obedience. So this class is for us as Christians to study the means and the ways that we can become more like God in our lives. As Christians, already believing God is the essence, the source of good, we want to be more like him, so we're studying what does it mean to be good. I'll soon share a definition that fits all of the varied uses in Scripture, as well as who God is, being uh, honor, honoring to the definition and the nature of God. So his workings on his behalf of his people... And what, we would like to, and what he would like to see in our lives. The definition I'm about to share covers all of that. And it will help you understand perhaps uh, for the rest of this class and the rest of your life what goodness is. I want to share with you a few verses first. In Matthew 10, 17, we're told that God is good. In Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to his children. Ephesians 2, 10, we are created in Christ for good works. That's going to be a key verse later. Okay, God is good. Um, situations can turn into good for beneficial us. Um, created in Christ for good works. So for today's class, here's the definition. <clears throat> that which is both upright and honorable as combined with and tempered by generosity. Generosity. That's the direction we're going to have to go. And, and, and I, I was <clears throat> lost studying what other people say, and, and it just wasn't clicking with me. And then I came across that. That's it. Generosity. There's something about not, about not just stopping short of what, what's required or, or just doing some good deed that you don't even have to do. It's, it's generous goodness with what? Uprightness, honorable, useful for purposes, beneficial for all goodness. I think I'm getting this here. The goodness of God, and I need to be like God. So when discussing theology, God study, people easily associate goodness with uprightness, but often overlook the connection with generosity. Is something or is anything good if it serves no purpose of blessing? Now, that's a deep question. You know, we say God has a purpose for everything, and if we are told that, then we look at some distant rock that seems to be just sitting there. Does that have a purpose? Well, it's on planet Earth, and that has a purpose. But, but is anything good if it doesn't serve a purpose or have, has no value? Michael? Yes, Glenda. Ephesians 5, 9 says, For the fruit of the Spirit is, is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Ooh, great one. Yeah, with recent studies of Ephesians, that was beautiful. Would you read that one more time for everyone's benefit? Ephesians 5, 9. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. So there is another spiritual reference, spirit-inspired reference to his fruit of goodness being born in our lives and connection with righteousness. Righteousness is right standing with God. It doesn't mean that you do right things, but if you are in right standing with God and you have that goodness, you are doing the things that God is, are, God is pleased with. So you are continually generous with your righteous life and you found righteous life. Great point. So here's another rhetorical question. Is something good? if holding no value or offering no service. Why would I wear this watch if it didn't work? Why would I hold this for 45 minutes if it didn't work? Is something good if it serves no purpose? Consider the Christian's life. Now, this is a hard question for conversation and for our discussion. Are we living good lives? Good, 
lives. If we are not being of service to help others to God's glory, Ephesians 2.10, we are created for good works. Are we generous to find them and to work them? Satan will discourage us. That's a whole other discussion. But are we desiring to be generous with our good works for the glory of God and the benefit of others? I want to be good. I want to live a good life. So, so I think that we're on the right trail here. We're, we're on a journey to discover what this fruit of the spirit of goodness is all about. So God is both upright and generous. He certainly expects the same of us. Today in this class, we're giving credit to him when he helps us obey this generosity because on our own, we have very little motivation to do such things for others. But if we have that goodness in our heart, we do the things for others that God did for all of creation, created and sustained them and and, and serves them, provides for them. Here's a bonus thought from Barclay. Um, Barclay's notes are popular in many fields, of course, in biblical studies. Barclay notes... And he's, he connects this. He connects the idea of generosity with justice. Now, this is interesting. There is a connection, but there's also a distinction. God is just. And, and that's a good thing that he is. He's holy. He's just. That means he can't just sweep injustice under the rug. He can't tolerate sin for forever. He has to deal with it. The good news he already has through Christ for those who come to him. Those who don't come to God through Christ, his son, have to pay for their own sin. He's just. And he's going to be true to his nature. All right? But... Barclay describes how the Greeks related justice with goodness. So good, just, just, good. Okay. Generosity and justice are different. But goodness and generosity go hand in hand. The Greeks taught that justice is the quality which gives a man what is due him, whether it be good or bad. Goodness is the quality which is out to do far more than just that and which desires to give a man all that is to his benefit and help. If you want to connect agape love to this, agape love, to have that, you would have that goodness, certainly. So, the man who is just sticks to the letter of his bond, does no more. The man who is good goes far beyond that. This suggests the primary idea of goodness is generosity, to do more than the bare minimum requirement. That's not the way the world looks at it, is it? Oh, I was good. I did my job. According to God, how's your heart? Did you enjoy it, number one, for the right reasons? And are you desiring to go above and beyond for God's sake? Serving with generosity with the agape love is positively addictive. I look back and and, and how I used to think, and and I'm adjusting with certain realities, but I'm still wanting to hold on to this. Satan knows that it is addictive to devote yourself fully to the Lord. So he will try to discourage you. And if that's the case, you don't want your enemy to win. You don't want to spend an eternity uh, like his fate is promised. So move forward. Get thee behind me, Satan. Move forward. Let the moving of arms to propel him behind you, let motivate you with momentum to go forward and honor God doing what he wants you to do. Goodness in your heart is what we need, and we pray for it. We pray for it, we obey, and he nurtures it, he develops it. It's not of our own accord, except that we desire it to be in our lives. (coughs) Sorry about that. All right. Let's examine this definition, generosity. Obviously, goodness is a spiritual virtue comprised of uprightness and charity. In the New Testament, the word goodness is often used to contrast evil. Okay. I read that, and then I look at verses like this, Matthew 6, 22, 23. Someone with a good eye sees positive uses for wealth, gains whatever amount of money and pro- uh, pro- Uh, and property by honorable means, someone who is good and generous with the prosperity God has given him or her. But notice this. The context speaks of an evil eye, which is begrudging and ungenerous in Proverbs 28. You see the difference between good and evil? There are good and evil people going to work and and coming home and, and living the same lifestyle, but 
according to God's view, one is seeking God's kingdom first, wanting to honor God by an honest day's work and then to use those, money, uh, those funds manageably well and then to meet other people's needs as well as responsibilities. And, and just to the glory of God, the other person's doing it all for him or herself. God sees the difference. Matthew 20, 30, um, Matthew 20, verses 13 through 15, Jesus uses the term good and evil to talk about the, the laborers and the parable of the laborers. Um, and that's interesting. You remember that story well. They came and some worked all day and still got what they were told that they would get and later in the day and, and got the pay for the whole day's work. <laughs> Keep in mind, this parable was directed to the Jews who were critical of Jesus for being generous to the Gentiles and outcasts. Whoa, that context makes all the more sense, doesn't it? Jesus being inspired and spirit aided at that time, no doubt. I'm always amazed with how spot on he was and to use an illustration that just, I mean, he's God, of course. We would expect the best, master teacher. But this parable was used to defend God against the charge that he was being unjust or dishonorable to his people. And Jesus basically says, I, I've done what is fair. And then are you upset because I was generous with my possessions? Um, he contrasts the two terms and thus gives us better insight into what goodness is. In Matthew 20, 13 through 15, it says, but he answered one of them and said, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish I could give, uh, and it says this, I wish I could give uh, to this Last man, the same as to you, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Now, there's the key verse that I looked at different translations because we come across this word for good. How is it translated? The NIV says, because of the context of generosity, the NIV says, or are you envious because I am generous? Whew, translators did a lot of work on that one. Good job. The NAS New American Standard says, or, are, or is your eye envious because I'm generous? Okay. And the New King James says, or is your eye evil because I am good? In the context, good is generosity. Above and beyond what's just. And the contrast of that is evil. If you don't care about giving of your means to help for the righteous cause. Interesting. So here, evil does refer to envy, and good refers to generosity. That was fascinating to me. Uh, these Jews had an evil heart, envious of a good and generous deed. We all have to uh, weed out that, uh, um, pull out that weed in our soul as we grow to truly rejoice with others who rejoice we sometimes think, well, why didn't that happen to me? This goes way back probably in your life or if you're in, in the Christian life and you're growing, still maturing, that's one weed that has to come out. Rejoice with people who rejoice, and that's not easy. It's easier to weep with those who weep. I think our previous Wednesday night speaker said that. Um, but these Jews had an evil heart, envious of a good, generous deed. A comment relating to this parable of the laborers that I want to mention in the context of goodness is that those people who worked for the ma uh, uh, the landowner uh, in that field all day long because it's comparing being in the kingdom of God and working your good works for the master. I think it's great that God offers eternal life to anyone at any time when they come to him. That's amazing and generous. But don't wait that long. Those who serve the master all day should have been more joyous in their hearts for the right reasons, focusing on the fact that I was called early. I'm doing all these good things for his honor, and that's why I'm thankful. I came when I did. They had the, they had the better blessing. Someone says, no, they, the person who came later got an easy day and still got the full pay. That's, that's a worldly mindset. That's not quite right. A spiritual comparison is give God your best years. Give God every day. Right now, from this point forward, don't wait because you're living and you're growing in him and and they should have had this more spiritual blessing. And those who serve God longer do because they grow and they mature in the fruit of the Spirit. But we're thankful that God is generous, right? He's not just just and giving people what they've earned. He, he's generous above and beyond that. So let's be very clear with how we're using this today, less, in case we're already not. 
Goodness consists of acting honorably. Now, so far that sounds like kindness, right? Acting honorably and fairly with all. That sounds like kindness. Yet tempering honesty and integrity with generosity. So in my mind, whenever I hear a preacher or a teacher or skim over the class reading of a Galatians con uh, passage, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kind of self-control. Self you know, <laughs> if I don't read it that fast, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. In my mind, I hope that I clearly distinguish the difference between that kindness Godly behavior at times when you don't really want to or think it's deserved, and goodness. You temper justness with what a person deserves versus what you remember. Godly behavior, goodness. Let goodness win, and then you'll be kind for sure and go above and beyond. The person who, um, here are two examples to help distinguish and to illustrate the difference. The person who displays goodness is not like the person who is simply just. The person who is just gives only to another what he has earned. Whereas the person who is good is generous to give what was not deserved. Okay? As we contrast good and evil, the person who displays goodness is not like the person who is evil. The person who is evil begrudges everything he has to give. God loves a cheerful giver because he is one. The person who is good and is open-hearted and open-handed is generous. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm beginning to see some differences here. <laughs> Generosity is the key word that uh, eliminates the evil that would otherwise be in my heart if I embrace the Spirit. And aren't there situations in life that will test your goodness how generous do you want to be? I'm not talking about money here. With your time and your effort, your attention, your focus, your skills, your energies. How generous, how generous do you want to be? And when do you cut it off and why? <sighs> Examine yourselves every, at every turn. And uh, you'll, you'll find the, the areas that are still not quite pure. But that's where God's going to help. Let's begin to understand this trait. A little bit less time on this. Let's understand this trait a little bit more. I was looking. It's been said, and this is from one resource. I'm thankful I came across this. Uh, it's been said that goodness is easier to understand when seen. Easier to recognize than to define. So, let's observe some good people. In the Bible, in the scriptures, Barnabas. Start with him. He's a good guy. Well, what does that mean, good guy? Hmm. In Acts 11, 24, we were told he is a good man. Okay, there's our word. And notice the goodness of Barnabas is mentioned in immediate context to his affirmation that he was full of the Spirit. That's no coincidence. Of course he was good. He was full of the Spirit. Being Spirit-led, nurtured, and matured. Are there any specific traits in the Bible that we see for Luke to say that this man was good? Well, yes. Notice as I read some of the traits. This is like a little mini Devo on Barnabas. The first time we meet him, he was acting with special generosity. There it is. Special generosity of his possessions toward his brethren. That's a sign of goodness. Can, are you good if you're not? Hmm. Letter B or next, Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, he was generous with his words of encouragement. You may not have much in terms of funds, but what you do have, do you give? Generous with words of encouragement. If you've got them, share them. That's how he got his name. The next time we see him, uh, around Acts 9, he's using personal credibility to bring his brethren to an understanding that this person should be accepted in the body. <laughs> It's not that he wasn't already, but how they treated him was very important, very important. So Barnabas, I, I can't help but think of what God would have had to do otherwise, but he worked through Barnabas to make sure Paul was accepted. In chapter 11 of Acts, Luke tells of the disciples learning in a church in Jerusalem that had been established among the Gentiles up in uh, Antioch of Syria. They were in there, they were hearing this news, and they said, what do we need to do to help and send encouragement? 
Barnabas was a great choice since he was a kind man. There's that word kind. Kind, that's spiritual influence. And who would make such a church stable by his presence. Kind and stable are two other traits. Yes, sta stability, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Meek, meek and gentleness, connect. I have to make a mental note to myself that any time in the future that I, I teach on the, perhaps the fruit of the Spirit or the Beatitudes, it's best to pr teach and preach on those combined because it makes for great parrot lessons, just like today. Today's goodness lesson and how it's going to conclude will be very helpful for our sermon. In Acts chapter 13, we're focusing on Barnabas, what makes him good. When the church at Antioch decided that the gospel must be spread, they prayed for God to show them who to send for this grand missionary enterprise. And the Spirit said, Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas was a man who was happy to see the progress of others and was not envious. I do know some preachers, I've, I've seen them, and I don't fellowship much with them because of their temperament. I, I can't relate, but I've, it is the case. Sad to say that there are some preachers envious, uh, uh, or I should say very protective, overly protective of their pulpit. Uh, it's not theirs. But Barnabas was a humble, generous encourager. He cared about the work, that even if it meant someone else could do better from this point forward, so be it. And that's beautiful. He's a good man. And again, this is consistent with our definition. Barnabas just served the Lord. That's what he cared about. No self-glory. These qualities identify specific traits of goodness demonstrated in him. Goodness is a part of the fruit of the Spirit, and it's evident because he was filled with the Spirit. So how are we to display this virtue ourselves? What are some things as we continue looking, the displaying of virtue? Sometimes you may not have the words, you may not have uh, the funds, for example, or the time, but what else can you do to display goodness? In addition to generosity, though, it says goodness is displayed through the very life's scenarios, and it proves it requires the soul to possess virtues of compassion and holiness. You have a lot of opportunities today to display uh, compassion and holiness. Let me read to you a piece that I borrowed from another person's work. A good person is honorable in conduct without being condescending towards those who, who's, uh, who act dishonorably. Now, in a way, that's kindness because you're not giving them what perhaps they deserve in responding in kind, but what you do is beyond that. You're not just kind, but you're good. Righteous without self-righteous, urgent to defend the truth without leaving the impression he knows all of it himself. A good person, um, separate from, separated from sin without himself setting up as a judge of others, because we remember we were once in that ditch, and God is the judge. We must practice a sense of genuine community that allows the world to see our love for one another as we exhibit Christ's holiness to the world. There's that fellow. That's how the world is going to know there's something different about them, and I want that. It's attractive. If we're not living it, it won't be attractive. That's one of the best testimonies to, uh, and, and supports for evangelism is if we show the world how we're treating one another like God wants us to, and then this gentleman goes on to say, if we stress the love of God without his holiness, it's a compromise. If we stress his holiness without his love, we practice something that is hard and lacks beauty. To stress both purity and love, we must always look to the collective work of God. Francis, interesting. Okay, that's the author. Interpreted, goodness is a fruit that produces uprightness, tempered by generosity, which makes righteousness appealing when seen by those whose hearts are good soil, ready for receiving the gospel. It's attractive. We're looking here at demonstrating this virtue. Uh, Dorcas, we're told in Acts 9, 36, she was a good woman, a good woman, full of good works and charitable deeds. Even in her death, her goodness was honored in chapter 9, verse 39. They were showing off her garments and her tunics, her work. And I doubt that they were just praising her skill. Why were they doing this? 
they were doing this because they were praising her, um, her uh, love and charity that went into making those and how good she was to share with others and meet their needs. So that's a good way to define goodness, consistent with our definition. Number uh, three in my notes, uh, goodness, why was she good? Dorcas was good because well, one who does right, lives by lofty principles and exhibits integrity will be deemed trustworthy without ulterior motive. That was a beautiful sentence. I came out, I'm glad I found it because it lists here. Does right, principles, integrity, trustworthy, and without any ulterior motives means you're pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Beautiful, right? You're focused on God, and that's it. That's it. And then you're able to just enjoy life to the full because of that. By contrast, those with an evil eye, you will be always suspicious of them, wondering what their intent is and, and if they're sincere. 1 Peter 3, 16 through 17, let me know that I should just continue serving the Lord because that's what's right, regardless of other people, because I'm responsible and accountable for my own life. Very briefly, in conclusion, um, I like reading Ephesians 5, 8 through 9. Uh, this is a very powerful, powerful passage, Ephesians 5, 8 through 9. And uh, <laughs> yes, and uh, Glenda was right on it as well. Let me go ahead and cue that up, and you can turn with me if you want to, by all means. I, uh, sometimes I just allude to something, and other times it's worth the time to turn to. Ephesians 5, 8 and 9. I remember uh, making this notation very quickly, and in this morning, early hour, I had forgotten about this, but I love this. For you were once darkness, there's that contrast, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as Christian or children of God, children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all, there it is, goodness, righteousness, and truth. Momentarily, when she read that, I thought, that sounds familiar. I'm not sure if it's in this class or not, but it is, yay. And then verse 10, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Well, what is acceptable to the Lord? Doing what you're supposed to do. Being how you're supposed to be. Um, the Bible is God's will for our lives. The Bible is God's will for our lives. And as we live, we do what we believe the Lord would want as we're spirit-led and influenced and guided. So those who are truly led by the Spirit of God will produce the quality of goodness. Are you more good today than you were years ago? You need to be. You better be. If not, something's, something's wrong. Now, I know we go through valleys up and downs, and it's hard to... To, uh, harder at times to obey God's will for your life in certain scenarios, but that challenges our purity, doesn't it, and our strength. So this is where we need God's help to continue to develop us. I'd like to, continue, uh, to conclude this class by reading almost a full page uh, that I typed off from one person's work. That, uh, I don't think the Brotherhood was ready for it, but they sure needed it. If you're curious about the source, I will let you know. I, uh, I will defend any truth from a work that the brotherhood rejects if it's true. So as I read this, just listen carefully to everything we've discussed and see if um, all these connection points and questions and thoughts that are kind of maybe abstract in your mind become solidified. I'm going to read 120 and 121 in this little small book titled In Step. <coughs> Excuse me. In Step with the Spirit of God. I wish I could mute that. Sorry if I can't. Spirit-prompted goodness now see right there, that's a lot said right there, isn't it? Spirit prompted goodness. And the resulting good character, name and works in a believer's life are totally different from the good works someone might attempt for the sake of merit before God. Oh, that's heavy. Oh, this is heavy. The former lifestyle of divine goodness being formed within us. When I say former, it's referencing the text, not before Christ. Okay. The lifestyle of divine goodness being formed within us and exhibited in our actions is the fruit of the Spirit. 
the other of merit before God, just that's it on our own strength, is a pious fraud perpetrated for selfishness of seeking attention or praise. And we know what the Lord says about that. In other words, let's get real. Let's be what goodness really is. We seek righteousness of God. We seek God because we know he is righteous and he imputes that righteousness to us as we desire to obey and his spirit develops us. This is great. So a biblical case in point would be Barnabas' good act of generosity. Generosity. There it is again. Contrasted with Ananias and Sapphira's mock act of generosity. What was wrong is they, they lied to make themselves look more generous than they were. So they weren't good people. Huh. I learned a lot this past week. What Barnabas did originated with a noble motive, but what they did was prompted from a desire to be noticed for their false piety. A rule of thumb for separating spirit-generated goodness from its counterfeit is this. Oh boy, since when I'm reading a person's work and they're spot on and, I, and, I'm, and they're about to give me a clue to help my spiritual lenses see better and, and to, to, to see more in a room by people's behavior, I, I have my full attention. I said, okay, what does it say? How do you react when your goodness is misunderstood rejected, taken advantage of, or even used against you. What do I do from that point forward? How do other people react when that's done? What was their intent? If they're offset, were they just wanting self-praise? Not encouragement, that's not something else. Self-praise? Hmm. If forgiveness and returning good for evil are involved in your response, that demonstrates that you're allowing God's presence in your life. And you are exhibiting his genuine goodness. Okay, that's a long sentence, but in case I missed it, if I respond to that evil when my good initial act was not accepted or reciprocated properly, if I still exhibit his genuine goodness, I will be mercifully forgiving and loving, returning good for evil. All right. And that is how we can know if we're growing in the fruit of, of goodness. He continues to say, unfortunately, a good person will polarize people with impure hearts. Jesus did. And there's our segue into the sermon today. The persecution that comes and the indestructible happiness that we can have. A good person will polarize some people with impure hearts. Jesus did. His goodness attracted some people to him and repelled those who were pious frauds and it drove them nuts when he brought that out clear as day they were then repulsed by him how did he jesus always react while on earth as our example and even towards the cross well jesus offered salvation to the very ones who rejected him that's that's not kind that, that's that's not just kindness that's generosity that's goodness he offered salvation, and it was made possible for all people, even those who crucified him. So, let's have this same goodness of the Spirit in our lives. Romans 8, 9 and 11. All right. I wanted to make sure to go through my notes slowly because I didn't have as much in content, but that, that's the time, isn't it? Wow. I hope that you appreciate goodness more than you have before. It's not easy. It goes above and beyond. And I hope that that term, above and beyond, describes you because goodness of the Spirit is just filling your heart, filling your soul, and defining your very character. All right, next week, divine faithfulness.